Okay, right. We've got quite a lot of people here and we've got quite a lot of get to get through as well. So I'm going to kick things off. So thanks everybody for joining us. I'm glad that you've made it at the right time because the clocks have gone back, gone forwards in the US and they don't spring forward here for another week. So it's always a bit confusing. Well, I find it confusing anyway. So I'm really glad that you've all made it and I hope you're excited to hear what's new in Wagtail. Um, so I'm Lisa, I'm Head of Marketing at Torchbox and I'm delighted to introduce our speakers and what we're covering today. So we're gonna be showing you features in the, and updates in the latest 4.2 release. We're gonna be telling you why we're moving to Wagtail 5.0 next. We're going to give a sneak peek at what's ahead on the roadmap. And we've got a couple of other golden nuggets thrown in that weren't on the agenda. So it's worth sticking around to the end if you can. And your speakers today are, I'd like you to give a little wave when I mention your name, please. We've got Thibaut, who's Senior Front End Developer and Wagtail Consultant. We have Albina and Demma Lola, who are Outreachy Participants. We'll be telling you more about the Outreachy program. And we've got Matthew, Senior Dev and Wagtail Consultant. We've got Sage, who's Wagtail Developer. Ian, our Wagtail Director. And Tom Dyson, who's Torchbox Co-Founder and Technical Director. So this is a webinar, so you can see us, but we can't see you, but we would love it to be interactive. So please use the Q&A for any questions that you have, and we'll answer some via the chat as we go. We'll ask some live as well, and we have got a bit of time at the end to ask some more questions to our speakers live. And I am recording the session so that I can send it to you afterwards, and live transcripts have been enabled if you'd like to use them. So we're going to be finished at six o'clock UK time, and then hopefully you're going to leave armed with loads of new and exciting ideas for your Wagtail projects. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Tom Dyson. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I was going to give a summary of, of what's coming up, but I think you've covered that beautifully. So I think I'm just going to hand over to Matthew, who you will know, I think, from Slack also as, as Gasman on GitHub. Matthew's going to talk to us about chooser panels. Yeah, so uh, yeah, today I'm going to show you the uh, multiple chooser panel, which is a user experience enhancement uh, that was uh, sponsored by YouGov that's been uh, introduced in the uh, 4.2 release. So here we have a blog post with an image gallery, um, which is based on an inline panel uh, where each item is an image with a caption. And um, so on a page like this, there might be sort of a couple of dozen images on here, and to uh, to add one, you would uh, to click here, and then there's yeah, there's kind of a lot of clicking involved. What if to to add to large numbers of images here, and it's not really a great user experience for editors. So multiple chooser panel is a drop in replacement for inline panel in this common case where you've got uh, 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 one of the fields uh, in the inline panel being a chooser so we've got an image chooser here and as I say it's a drop in replacement so we can just change that the, to a multiple chooser panel and then there is just one addition which is chooser field name and because here the image the chooser field is called image. That's what we put here. So just wait a moment for that to reload. And then if I refresh that page, initially it uh, looks the same, but this time when we click add gallery image, then we immediately get the, uh, the, the pop-up image chooser allowing us to select multiple images. And then when I sort of confirm and close this, that has populated the panel with as many images that, as uh, I chose. So from here, um, it works just the same way as a standard inline panel would. I can proceed to fill in the caption and reorder things, delete them, just as you would with a standard yeah, image chooser. So this is a fairly unassuming looking change that will have a big impact on the editor experience and this is made possible through various other pieces of work that we've covered here in the past um, because it, this isn't just for image choosers and um, here I've also set this up for the the, the author snippets so we can sort of select multiple authors here and have them immediately added 
And this is possible through Telepath, which was introduced in 2.11 or 10 um, as a way of creating and populating fields programmatically in a standardized way. And now we're able to use that outside of stream field too, because since all of our sort of chooser widgets implement this common API for how they are, how we get data in and out of them, we're able to uh, to populate those um, programmatically and uh, and make sh and be sure that it will always work the same way across all choosers. And also the uh, work that we did in 4.0 to bring all of our chooser modals under a common base implementation means that the work to add this multiple chooser mode was only really had to be done once and now that has become a standard feature of all of our choosers so this is really a great example of how the work that we've invested into infrastructure improvements in the co-base can give real benefits further down the line uh, to end users for the long term Thanks, Matthew. I know that's going to be a big help to a lot of people, including many users of, uh, of sites that we build here at Torchbox. Um, so it's always a kind of precise problem that, that I've seen up and come up a few times. Uh, there's a question come in here. Will the multiple chooser panel allow uploading multiple images directly into an image gallery? Um, not right now. So that that is, uh, yeah, that would be a really good addition and it wouldn't, it hopefully wouldn't be a huge uh, addition fr from uh, from this point um the, i suppose there would be a, a, yeah a, some sort of design considerations in how you would fill in things like the uh, the alt text as you're uploading but the there was uh, a, a, an existing add-on package that was doing that um i think i think it is called um multiple image chooser or something like that and um so and that, i think that was a bit of a, an inspiration for for this feature and I think now, now that we have this uh, infrastructure in, in Whitetail, we'll be able to support that sort of use case um, a lot better, um, more stably. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, and then if you're ready, perhaps you could continue to talk about Streamfield migration. Yeah. OK, so um, so yeah, um, as uh, many of you probably know, Streamfield gives you a uh, lot more freedom for managing and arranging your content than you would normally get within the constraints of a database structure. And um, that's possible because the, uh, the, the stream data is stored all as one big JSON bundle rather than across many database fields. And the trade-off there is that if, uh, yeah, whenever you change the data structure within a stream field, for example, here we've got an, an image plus caption, and maybe when you started out building this, you just had an image field on its own, and then in order to add these extra fields, then you have to change that into a structs block containing the image block and these additional fields. And when you make those sorts of changes, you can't take advantage of Django's migration framework to ensure that those changes in structure propagate to your existing data. Because from the database schema's perspective, nothing has changed. It was a big bundle of JSON before, and it still is now. So this has been a notable missing piece for quite some time. And so uh, last year, uh, um, for as part of the uh, sort of Google Summer of Code initiative, uh, uh, Sandil Ranasingh um, came up with um, this uh, uh, this new feature to uh, address that, and the idea is that alongside the schema migration generated when you change your stream field definition and run make migrations, you would add a data migration to update the JSON accordingly, and it's as you can see it's all thoroughly documented, and there are some various uh, different helper functions um, to put in your migrations to uh, handle cases like yeah modifying adding removing block types and and it's yeah and there's this yeah so it's really flexible there's yeah a lot lot of power here 
And in the current version shipped with Wagtail 4.2, you would have to write these migrations yourself, but there's also a separate package, Wagtail Streamfield Migration Toolkit, um, which was in fact the original output of Sandil's Google Summer of Code project before being incorporated into Wagtail Core. And this has limited support for auto detecting the changes and generating those migrations for you. So this is something that's yeah still very much in active development. So it was a new release of this package in January. And so it's yeah definitely something I would encourage you to try out both the version in Wagtail Core and uh, the, the, uh, the, the Streamfield Migration Toolkit package. And, uh, yeah, you, and your feedback will uh, definitely help uh, shape the uh, direction of this in future. Thanks, Matthew. Um, a couple of questions here. One, which I think you just answered, is if we're stuck on Wagtail 4.1, uh, do we still have access to the Streamfield migration tools? Okay, so so yeah, the uh, Streamfield migration toolkit uh, package that was uh, that that was built against the 4.1. So yeah, if you're on the long-term support release, you can install that package, and uh, and that will be available to you as well. Great, uh, and from. Josh, any changes planned to the current behavior of automatically generating useless Django migrations every time a stream field gets tweaked? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is this is uh yeah, uh, it's been a bit of a contentious one. Um, I uh, I think yeah, th there are sort of quite subtle reasons, yeah, in favor of doing that. Um, I know that yeah, but yeah, they yeah, it, it's it's on, only very sort of niche. Uh, uh, circumstances that 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 really comes into play when you're doing data migrations. Um, I know there has been to um, moves to change that. I can't quite remember what the status of it was. I think uh, so. Cohen posted a snippet. I think there is an open an open issue on the Wagtail GitHub about this. I think Cohen posted a, a snippet for disabling that behavior. Maybe it's a package. I can't. Don't know if anyone remembers. But uh, yeah, I think it's something we're aware of, and uh, I think that there are workarounds for it. Well, we'll dig that out and um, and get the link, and either share it now or in the information that Lisa will share with everybody after this webinar. One more question, uh, not directly related to what Matthew's just been talking about, from Louisa: How does Wagtail compress images uh, in terms of size and weight for SEO? Does this new gallery improve for that? So this this, this new gallery, the, the feature that Matthew showed doesn't change the Wagtail's image serving behavior. There is a lot of control over the, the, the format and the size and the, the compression on each image that you can apply uh, either as a general level, but also per image or, um, from the template. Nevertheless, this is something that we continue to work on. And um, uh, so I think maybe Tebow might touch on this later, but uh, uh, if no, I think Ian's going to mention this in the roadmap. But um, yeah, just, just to say that there's already control, but it's something that we are we are continuing to work on to to uh, optimize images and to reduce the bandwidth by uh, by default on Wagtail sites. With that, I'm going to move on and hand over to Sage, who's going to talk to us about snippets. All right. Hey, thanks, Don. Hey, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, if you've been following Wagtail for a while, you may have noticed that we've been supercharging our snippets feature with new functionalities that help you manage your smaller bits of content. And in Wagtail 4.2, we are excited to bring you even more of those features. This time we have locking and workflows for snippets. This feature is optional and can be enabled by adding the in newly introduced mixins to your models. And to demonstrate, I have the lovely bakery demo website here. And I'm going to enable the locking feature um, to the person model. So to do that, I add a, an import from whitetail.models. Um, I import the lockable mixin and I add it to one of the super classes for the person model. And since this mixin adds some database fields, I will have to rerun the migrations. And then I restart the server.
after enabling the mix in, if I go to settings, groups, and I'm going to edit the moderators group, I can now see the lock and unlock permissions for the person model. So I'm going to give those permissions to the moderators group. Hit save. And before I proceed, I would like to let you know that I will be using multiple different users. Um, I have an editor user, I have a moderator user, and an admin user. So uh, I will be switching between different browser windows, and I suggest that you pay attention to the lower uh, left corner of the screen that tells you which user I'm currently acting at, as. Um, and so I'm going to switch over to the moderator user. And if I try to edit one of the people snippet, I now have the information that this snippet is currently unlocked and I can unlock, uh, I can lock this snippet. And if I do so, it says that it was locked by me and I have the option to unlock it. And what happens is that if I now switch over to the editor user um, right here and I try to edit the same snippet, I will not be able to do so and it says that it's locked by moderator. And yeah, I, I cannot make any changes. However, if I am acting as another user who, um, who has the unlock permission, so at first I will not be able to edit the snippet, but I have the option to unlock it. And if I unlock this, I will now be able to edit the snippet normally. So um, this is, how locking has always worked for pages. And it's just that we have now brought the feature to snippets. And the next feature is the workflows that you can enable by adding workflow mixin. So I'm going to add that. And since this mixin does not add any database fields, I can go ahead and continue by going to settings and workflows. Here I'm using the default moderators approval that Whitetail gives you, but of course you can use any uh, other workflows that you have configured on your website. And if I scroll down, I now have the option to assign the workflow to snippets and it will show you the list of models with workflow mix and enable. And in here I'm going to enable the workflow to the person model. If I hit save. And now what happens is that if I switch to the user, uh, the editor user, and I reload the page, if I try to make changes to the snippet, I now have the option to submit to moderator's approval. And if I do so and try to edit again, I cannot because it's currently in moderation and only reviewers for the task can edit. And the only option that I have is to cancel the workflow. And I can see the status side panel. Uh, it tells you that it's currently in moderation and it shows you current stage and you can get a link to the full history of the workflow. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to switch to the moderator user and let me just reload the page. Okay, I can edit this snippet because I'm a moderator. And in addition to the normal actions that I have, I now have the action to request changes, uh, to approve and publish, and approve with comment and publish. And before I do any of those actions, I will yes. just show you. Um, so this snippet is currently used on this mincemeat tart page. And if I look at the live page, um, okay. it shows that the snippet has not been updated because the changes that I made, um, it was still in draft. It was still in the workflow. And now if I hit approve and publish, I can see that the changes are now live. And if I reload the page, you can see that the changes have been reflected to the snippet and thus the live page as well. So yeah, that's uh, workflows for snippets. It's basically 
how workflows has been working for pages, but we've brought the feature to snippets as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tibet. Thank you, Sage. Um, I've got a couple of questions about snippets. First is, can you reuse the same workflow and tasks for both pages and snippets? Yes, uh, definitely. So we, we are using the same workflow object that we've been uh, that we have always had for pages and it's and now you can assign the same workflow to snippets, but you have to check um, the instance of the object, whether it's a page or a snippet, if, if you would like to handle it differently, otherwise you can just reuse it the same way. Great. And another, what's the future of model admin versus snippets? Um, that's something that we would like to address in the 5.0 release. Uh, we will be introducing features that we have in model admin to snippets. So hopefully you can further customize the snippets, like the menu items and the URLs. And yeah, hopefully once that uh, has been brought to snippets, uh, snippets can be the definitive way for you to edit Django models in the admin. There's a, a discussion about this or an RFC, which I will, maybe one of the team here can find a link and we'll share it in the chat. Um, because it's uh, that, that answers that question is answered pretty comprehensively there. A uh, question from Bethany: Does the comment feature just send a comment to the editor user? Um, so the commenting feature is uh, you will be able to see the comments in the status of the workflow. So every if all users can who can see the snippet will be able to see the comment, but you can also customize uh, the uh, how the comment is displayed by using custom tasks as well. Thanks, Sage. Uh, with that, we're going to have to move on, and I'm going to hand over to Thibaut, who's going to talk about UX feedback. Thank you, Tom. Hi, everyone. I'm Thibaut. I'll switch over to my screen share, and yes, I'm going to talk about uh, UX feedback, how we've handled this over the last year or so, and um, specific improvements we've made in the very last release, what is 4.2. So right now we're looking at uh, the page data UI in the very last release for a blog page on our bakery demo website, which I'm sure is getting you hungry already. I'll switch over to a version of this page from about a year ago in Whitetail 2.16. And I, I think there's quite a stark contrast in the interface. And um, essentially over the last, yeah, about a year or so, as part of our page editor 2022 project, we have been working on iteratively improving this user experience, focusing on the page editor in particular. I'll switch over to Whitetail 3.0 now, and you'll see some of the gradual improvements we brought. Um, there is quite a few themes on here about um, user customization, how much of this we've been able to change thanks to investments we made into the technical depths, resolving that in, in our UI code base. Um, and a, a strong theme as well, in my opinion, is how much feedback we've gotten from people um, to help us shape those releases. So I'll now switch over back to the very last uh, version of this we've voted 4.2. Uh, I'll, I'll be demonstrating the rich text features on there shortly, but we can also take a quick look at some of the features we have on there. Uh, the side panels, having a live preview that's been a often requested feature in the CMS, having a way to resize this panel as well has been something that people came back to us to request those changes. And um, we definitely try and make the most of that feedback and be as open with our visual design and UX process as we are with the Python and Django changes of the code base. So what does it mean to give feedback practically? Well, uh, I had mentioned the page editor project we had been running for quite a while with this um, GitHub discussions thread. Um, this has been our most active discussion on GitHub ever. And I think that's great. And I really hope that we get to bring that kind of transparency to all our UX changes in the future. Um, closer, to, closer to what we're working on at the moment, uh, we have a feedback thread about minimap UI refinements. So the minimap is one of those new components we brought uh, a couple of releases ago that allows people to navigate the page more easily, section by section to the right here. 
Um, I believe quite a few people who are here today actually uh, have contributed to the different items on this specific ticket, uh, thinking of Tim and Ryan in particular. Um, and yeah, just for people who have this awareness of GitHub, going through those discussions on GitHub issues, adding their comments, that's invaluable for us. And for those that don't, we also have this specific feedback thread that's called um, editor experience feedback, uh, where we collate issues and comments and um, any, any notes that people want to relay from their editor team. So again, very invaluable to us. I will share this specific thread in the chat so everyone can take a look and uh, yeah, add their comments about the recent versions. And uh, back to rich text specifically. So rich text is an area I've spent quite a lot of time on myself. And in the last few releases, we've made uh, further tweaks to the change we had made in Whitehead 4.0. So quite a few people here will have already seen our um, inline toolbar, which we had introduced a few releases ago. And uh, we did believe that uh, in lots of contexts, for lots of users, this inline toolbar makes quite, quite a lot of sense. Uh, but we heard you loud and clear, very loud and very clear, and have reintroduced a way to pin it to the very top of the editor. I actually believe this as well is something that quite a few people in this specific webinar have discussed with us, and it's definitely helped us uh, shape this change in, in UX. So the toolbar is now pinnable. When it is pinned, it will be at the top of all of the editors on the page, not just this one. So I don't have to click this every time. And the toolbar now also contains all of the rich text options you have expected from past releases. And uh, we didn't stop at, at just this toolbar. So we had to choose quite a few other uh, rich text UX changes. Um, one of those that I'm really happy with is those, those slash commands. So if you press slash, in editor, you get this interface that displays both rich text and stream field options. Uh, we actually see this as a way to eventually bridge the gap between rich text and stream field so that as far as editors are aware, uh, they feel like one and the same. They feel very cohesive. So for example, on here, I can see both my rich text heading two and my stream field heading block quotes and so on. And um, this being a rich text experience, I can I can press the slash and then uh, further type in the editor and automatically for me select uh, the specific option in the rich text field that's the most relevant. I can press enter and move on. So that's one of the ways in this specific case that I can I can add a list item. But again, I can also do so with the toolbar at the very top. I can also do so with my inline toolbar, should I prefer to work this way. And we really see this um, versatility as a, a, a net positive for ourselves, uh, being able to cater both to power users and people who have never um, ever seen Wagtail before. And um, also from an activity standpoint, it's very important for us that this works equally as well for keyboard, screen reader, mouse, voice control software users, hence all of the options. So one of the, keep the feedback and, and questions coming by the way in the chat, I'll try and address them at the very end, if not during. Um, one of the other changes we've made again with this idea of uh, combining rich text and stream field is bringing this same rich text menu over to stream field. So now if I go into the plus option in between blocks, I see the same menu that has filterable options. And um, yeah, I, I, I believe this would be quite natural once people get to try this for themselves. And uh, again, I really encourage everyone here to take a look at this and uh, yeah, be like, let us know if any feedback you have on those features. And um, yeah, I believe we have a couple of minutes for questions now. Thanks, TV. Uh, I don't think any particular question. Oh, no, there is a question in from Tim. Is there an easy way to merge heading blocks and paragraph blocks into a single rich text block? It's a good question, Tim. Uh, I believe this is exactly the type of feature we'd eventually like to have if we're able to merge uh, rich text and, and stream field further. So the specific challenge here is that the, the data model between the two is, is quite different but that's only due to the history of how those features have been brought to Wagtail. There is no underlying reason why this isn't possible. So I believe eventually you'd get to the experience where you might be able to copy paste, copy say a sequence of stream field or rich text blocks 
and paste them and have that be the kind of interaction you use to to merge the blocks great and uh, not questions but certainly enthusiasm from uh, matthew on uh, thank you for the pinnable toolbar and from jeremy saying it's a great idea to blur the distinction between string fields and rich text um, there's a question about bakery demo from Eagle, but because we're running short of time, I think I'm going to let Sage answer that in text and move back to you, Thibaut, to talk about Outreachy. Yes, Outreachy. So for people who might not have heard of it yet, Outreachy is uh, one of those uh, open source outreach programs Wagtail has taken part in, just like Google Summer of Code in the past. So just like Google Summer of Code, Outreachy is an, an internship program for people who are underrepresented in technology and open source in particular. And uh, we, were, we were super keen to participate to this and honestly just humbled that we were allowed to participate into those programs. And um, today we have we have two of the participants. Actually, we might have a, a love F as well with us in the chat, I believe. So our, our participants are there, uh, Albina and Damilola, to take you through the projects they've been working on over the last three months and uh, yeah, just share a report of what their internship has been like and what changes they've made in Wacktail. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Albina, and I'm an outreach intern at Wacktail. I'm excited uh, to be here and talk about the new feature we're introducing in Wacktail 4.2 and accessibility checker. Uh, but before we dive into it, let's take a moment and talk about accessibility. Uh, we all know that accessibility is important, right? But it's actually more than just a moral or legal obligation. It's an opportunity to tap into a large and often overlooked market. Just think about it. There are 1.3 billion people with significant disabilities out there. And disabled adults in US alone have a disposable annual income of half a trillion dollars. What's not to like about all that? Uh, but here is a kicker, a uh, shocking 96% of all uh, of the world's top 1 million home pages still have basic accessibility issues uh, with an average number of 50 errors per page. Uh, we may ask ourselves why is this happening, and one of the reasons is that unlike JavaScript or CSS bugs, accessibility bugs are often untraceable and uh, happen without any warning. And even if we address accessibility issues during website development, uh, it can still mean that uh, accessibility, they can be uh, present in the content. Uh, so we at Vectail decided to address this and help our authors to identify and fix accessibility errors. So without further ado, let's meet our brand new accessibility checker built right into the user bar. It scans the page for errors and shows results like this. Uh, here you can see the total number of issues found, uh, the list of violations on the page, and the selectors for an accessible element. Our checker is based on AX, uh, world's most popular accessibility testing engine, making it powerful and precise with uh, close to zero false positives. Uh, we initially added some of the most uh, common violations uh, for content authors like empty headings, incorrect heading hierarchy, misusing paragraphs as headings, uh, but we didn't stop there. And in fact, in the latest version of the checker, we added more rules and also outlines uh, to highlight the elements, uh, the inaccessible elements on the page. Uh, our future plans for the checker include uh, integrating it into the page editor, so you can see the changes uh, instantly and make adjustments when necessary. Uh, we do believe that our checker is a significant uh, step forward in making sure that uh, website development is more inclusive for everyone. And in fact, uh, according to the audit conducted by my colleagues, Accessibility Audit, there are hundreds of uh, wagtail based uh, websites with exactly the same rule violations we are checking for with our checker. And uh, for some of them, there are thousands. Uh, so we encourage you to give our checker a try, to check your pages and feel that excitement upon publishing a page and seeing uh, zero accessibility issues found by the checker. Um, thank you. Thank you, Albina, for your presentation and also for your excellent work on this. Um, here we have a question from Patricia who asks, what version of Wagtail is accessibility checker in? 
Uh, it's uh, 4.2. So 4.2. Um, and also for Albina or Thibaut, does the accessibility checker have a way to ignore errors that aren't relevant? And that would indeed be super important. So the, the short answer is in 4.2 specifically, it doesn't because we're very keen to meet that release deadline. So we built the checker with very few checks that we are almost guaranteed have no uh, false positives when, when they do run. Um, in the next release, we're hoping to introduce a way to uh, um, dismiss errors that aren't relevant. Thanks, Tivo. And maybe you can also answer this one. Does your checker work to WCAG 2.1 standards? Uh, so the short answer is, is yes, it definitely does. It's using the AXE checking engine, which is one of the most popular ways to check for this specific standard. Technically, we have the checker configured to only uh, validate content focused aspects of those standards. So not the coding, not the visual design, but it does work against this standard and can be extended to cover other standards as well. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and I'm going to move on to Damalola, who's going to talk about his work on the editor guide. Hello, everyone. My name is Damalola Ladele, and I was an outreach in 10. Um, I worked on improving the editor's guide for work with CMS. Uh, I mean, for most organizations, they actually don't prioritize their documentation. And for this reason, it affects the way users perceive their products. So. We as Wakte, we've decided to gradually make improvements to our documentations, and this time around, we've made some major improvements to the uh, editor's guide for Wakte CMS. So one of the major improvements is the uh, try to share my screen now. One of the one of the improvements is the implementation of a writing style guide. So we conducted the gap analysis earlier on, which clear, which clearly showed that. Uh, there were some inconsistencies in the grammar and tone of the, of the editor's guide. And for this reason, we introduced the Google Developers Documentation Style Guide. For instance, if you check the various headings and subheadings within the editor's guide, you can see that they are shorter and more direct now, uh, of course. And on the face of it, they tell you what their content is all about. For instance, find your way around clearly tells you how to find your way around the CMS. Uh, then moving on to the second major change uh, or improvements, is the, is the structural one for the main sections. Uh, for instance, for the for the first main section of the editor's guide, we've changed the title from tutorials to getting started because obviously they have a tutorial within it. Now you have a getting started section and within it, you have an overview subsection, which kind of uh, introduce users to what work the CMS is all about. Uh, we plan to subsequently add more subsections to this section in the future. And moving on to the to the final major improvements, uh, we have the new concept section, which clearly has a uh, clearly has a uh, the various concepts used in the other sections of the of the editor's guide. For instance, if you go to find your way around, uh, you can see one of the concepts is uh, admin interface. If you click on it, it's going to take you a page that has the explanation for what what the interf uh, admin interface is about. And if you go to manage users. Another concept is the user's interface. And there you go. You have the explanation for what uh, user's interface is. Um, hopefully, uh, that is it for now. Hopefully, before the what's next and what they would have made some other major improvements to our editor's guide and uh, the developer's documentation. So uh, we really hope you stick around today. Thank you. Thank you, Damalola, and thank you for all your excellent work on this. It's a huge improvement, and I know already people are re appreciating the, the improved editor guide. Um, we're running a bit short of time, so I'm going to move straight on back to Matthew, who's going to talk about technical debt. Yep. So um, we've talked a lot about the some of the more visible user-facing changes in the last couple of releases, but there is, of course, a lot of less obvious work behind the scenes to address technical debt and solve some uh, long running bugbears. And one in particular that I will uh, sort of, I'll highlight because uh, it's the sort of thing that 99% sort of, of people will probably won't run into, but the 1% will be, oh yeah, finally this has been fixed, it, which is, um, this is a, a quirk when uploading a new document to replace an old one where 
it would uh, that the new document would be given a new file name and in some cases where you have a remote storage backend that isn't configured correctly then that can lead to uh, to documents being deleted and this has been it was quite a tough one to to crack because as well as having to deal with like remote storages it also touches on issues of how caching should work but this is uh, what one of uh, many sort of tiny things that has been fixed in 4.2 and uh, the subject of changes under the hood brings us on to the uh, next release so there have been quite a few updates uh, over the course of the 3.x and 4.x releases um, requiring changes to user code um, and where possible, we've tried to give people a smooth upgrade path. So to take as an example, the change uh, of the module paths so that rather than importing from wagtail.core.models, now it's just wagtail.models. Uh, we've left the old code paths in place so that things don't immediately break on upgrading, but you have a window of time to update your code. And this means that um, over time, we've had this steady accumulation of fallback code, making the Wagtail code base more difficult to maintain. And with that in mind, we've chosen the next release as the right time to drop that fallback code. And as a consequence, we intend to make the next release version 5.0. And I know that people have mixed feelings about uh, a major version bump like this, whether it's, oh, lots of exciting new features or, oh no, more disruption. I'm going to have to change all of my code to, to, to do, do the upgrade. And really it's neither of those because um, as, as I think we may have mentioned in a previous session, we've uh, recently adopted semantic versioning, which means that the version number isn't really a marketing term or an indication of uh, that this is an exciting new release, but it's more a tool for communicating the extent of breaking changes. And these are changes that if you've done things right, you will have made already. So looking over the, the changes that, that have required these deprecations over the last couple of, re, of releases, it was clear to us that the majority of the ones that would affect ordinary Wagtail sites happened in 3.0. So by the time the 5.0 release happens in May, then these will be things that have been on your radar for a full year and hopefully you've had that time to upgrade these so that there, there really is sort of nothing new to do for the 5.0. Um, the place where there might be some potential friction is with uh, third party packages. Um, there is the sort of eternal issue with uh, open source of people not having the resources to maintain things for the long term. So so quite often packages might have been put out and they haven't been kept up to date with all of these uh, incremental changes that have happened over the last year. Um, so that that does mean that um, that, that we those uh, that those have the potential still to be left behind unless people have applied these uh, necessary changes. And this is something we've uh, tried to address um, with, amongst other things, the uh, Wagtail Nest. Um, GitHub organization. So this is uh, an organization that is taking on uh, maintainership of some of the more popular packages. And this is one of the ways that we're ensuring that, uh, that things are getting the necessary changes to work with uh, 4.2, 5.0 and beyond. So in conclusion, the motivation for this 5.0 release, it's not about big bombastic changes, but it's really taking an opportunity to clean up some of the cruft in the project at a moment when that will minimize disruption, which is not to say that there won't also be notable new features in 5.0, but that's a different story, which uh, Ian will be talking about in a moment. Thank you very much, Matthew. And I think you've done my segue for me. Uh, and I'm going to hand straight over to Ian to talk about 5.0. Thank you, Tom and Matthew. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen so we can have a quick look at the public roadmap on GitHub. Uh, we've been doing lots of work on the Wagtail roadmap in recent months, collaborating with the core team to make sure that the wider Wagtail community has greater visibility on what's coming down the track in future releases. The public roadmap is going to be updated at least every three months, 
in the last month of our quarterly re release cycle. So look out for the next update in April. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity now to share a few highlights of the new features and enhancements we've got lined up for you. So as Matthew has said, our next release on the 2nd of May will be Wag Wagtail 5.0. Highlights include uh, enhancements to snippets, uh, which Sage is working on, um, accessibility checker enhancements, as Albina and Thibaut have already mentioned, support for SVG images, um, better autocomplete and boosting for search, further refinements to the page editor UI, and something I'm really pleased to share with you now, dark mode for the admin interface. So dark mode, as well as being an increasingly popular user preference, can reduce energy consumption of OLED monitors by up to 50%. There'll also be a high contrast mode. And dark mode is part of a program of sustainability work we're embarking on this year to make Wagtail as environmentally sustainable as possible. Alongside dark mode, in this release, Thibaut will also be producing documentation covering sustainability considerations for Wagtail sites. If we go back to the roadmap for a second and look further ahead, some upcoming highlights include a comprehensive overhaul of search, support for right to left languages in the Wagtail admin, a raft of media optimizations as part of the sustainability program I mentioned. A little further ahead, we've got auto save on the roadmap and a readability checker for editors. And you'll see that a number of these future features are tagged as needing sponsorship. Over the years, Wagtail has benefited enormously from the very generous support of organizations, including Google, Mozilla Foundation, Motley Fool, and YouGov. This has meant we've been able to deliver significant features and enhancements faster than would otherwise have been the case. So if your organization might be interested in sponsoring work in future releases, whether that's specific features that are on the roadmap or programs of work like sustainability or accessibility, we'd love to hear from you. One of the standout features we're planning to ship in an upcoming release is an optional treeless mode. Treeless is really, is, is the idea behind treeless is to help editors for whom Wagtail's tree-based explorer may not be the optimal way to find the content they want to work on. We're currently doing user needs analysis and have this early visual prototype to share. So you'll see in treeless a searchable, filterable, and sortable flat listing of all pages. In this example, we're looking at a relatively large instance of Wagtail with more than 32,000 pages. And I could filter by date range, uh, by site. This is a multi-site instance. I'll just filter by site A, uh, and I can filter by page type. So I'll select blog page. I've already selected Olivia as the author. And you can see I'm now, now looking at a subset of pages just 32 pages across the site. And because I work with this, this subset of co content on a regular basis, I can save this view and come back to it whenever I want to. We're confident that the addition of treeless mode will be a real efficiency boost for those of you with larger, more complex wagtail sites. And I'm now gonna hand back to Tom for some exciting R&D news. Thanks Ian. Uh, it's definitely some some excitement about treeless. It's it's uh, fun. It's quite funny seeing this because uh, Wagtail's tree capabilities were quite a big big part of its uh, uh, its sort of distinctiveness in the early days. Uh, having worked with some more uh, treeless options in the past and found them confusing, so um, uh, so it's interesting that that kind of treeless is also attractive in some scenarios. And I know there are many Wagtail users with huge collections of pages, hundreds of thousands or even millions, um, for whom the, the the hierarchical tree structure doesn't make so much sense. And, and, and this kind of filtering, particularly I think with that ability that you showed at the end to, to save filters is gonna be really valuable. Um, finally, I want to share, this actually wasn't on the agenda and it's something that's uh, just come up in the last week really that, that I was keen to, to squeeze in to, to this webinar. And uh, I'm sure none of you has uh, uh, has been able to ignore the explosion into public consciousness of artificial intelligence in general and um, large language models like ChatGPT in particular, and um, we, while you know, sharing some of the concerns about these technologies around around rights and around um, accuracy, 
are we're really keen to find ways that that we can use tools like ChatGPT and the API behind it to make the editor experience better. And um, in the last week, we've seen some really good development on this from uh, Tom Asher, one of our colleagues here at Torchbox. And uh, I'm going to try and show in a slightly risky live demo um, the, the work that Tom's been doing. So here's a new package from Tom uh, Wagtail AI. And um, it, it currently it's integrates with uh, OpenAI's APIs, but um, it's designed in a way that we can we can be flexible and and use um, other APIs, large language models in the future. And uh, I'll share a link for this, but I'll, I'll just show you Wagtail AI in action. So um, here I have the simplest possible Wagtail site with a single page and a body. And you can probably see here that I've I've made some mistakes. There's some mistakes. Of, I mean, the, the first one I've misspelled article, and that would be an easy fix that my browser spell checker has already noticed. Uh, but then there's also this word sum, which is uh, you know a correct spelling, although not correct in this context, and a little grammatical error with the space before the, the full stop. So now I'm able to select it and then choose from these two options, so AI correction or AI completion. I'm going to choose correction. And immediately it's come back and you see it's, it's fixed the spelling mistake, but it's also worked out that I was using the wrong version of sum in that case, and it's fixed the, the, the this punctuation error. Um, let me try something else. So this is a mistake that I have certainly made in the past. Um, again, the word principle here is correctly spelt, but it's very unlikely that that's the sort of principle I meant to use. Um, so that's something that would be hard for a, for a spell checker or grammar checker to pick up. But um, if we ask OpenAI, uh, and you, we get an immediate correction. So we're, it's now using the, the correct spelling of principle. So that's correction. Um, but uh, an, the, the latest change to Wagtail AI allows us to create, uh, Wagtail developers to create their own prompts. So if I switch to my editor now, I've got some prompts that I've prepared in advance. I don't know how clearly you can see this, but I'm just in my settings adding to the default prompts that are provided. Uh, here's a simplify one and also a couple of uh, translations. So I save that and it'll reload in my local developer environment and uh, select that text. And then uh, I need to refresh this page. So I'll select that chat and reload it. And let's use that new line. And now I go to the uh, AI menu and we can see our additional options. So if I wanted to translate to French, I'd probably, I'd probably ask Thibaut. I'd have a go myself and then Thibaut would correct me. But uh, I, if I wanted to convert to Arabic, then um, I might find it a bit harder to find someone near me. So, But this way I can choose it and uh, come straight back and uh, with, with an Arabic translation provided by ChatGPT. Um, and finally, for my last test, I'm going to try some article generation, an article about vertical farming. This is uh, something I'm quite interested in at the moment. Uh, I'd like to write an article about it, but um, uh, uh, just just to kind of get me started, I'm going to go into Wagtail and use Wagtail AI to, to stub this out for me. This one's going to take a bit longer because uh, uh, it's measured on tokens, which are the, um, uh, it's, it's like a sort of proxy for words. So the, the more tokens you need, the longer it takes. But you can see here now, I have my article stubbed out around vertical farming. This is um, this is not going to be, you know, the, the, the perfect article on vertical farming. And I don't know how many of you are going to be interested in this sort of content generation, but I think it can certainly provide uses around, perhaps around summarization or um, the creation of uh, descriptions or, or meta tags. Um, so I think this is this is early stages. There are lots of ideas that we have for improving this. Um, for example, creating embedding a, a vector database within Wagtail so that we could uh, detect similarity between documents, and then we could say things like, um, "Make me a summary of this article using the style of other articles in within Wagtail." Uh, but it's early days. I'm really interested in your opinions. I've seen a couple of questions coming up now, which I will attempt to answer. Um, the first one says that they work for a security conscious organization. Will there be a way to block the AI feature? And I just want to be really clear about this 100%. This would only ever be an opt-in 
feature of Wagtail. Um, you, it's 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 not part of Wagtail core. It would be an, 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 uh, a plugin package, and in even then, you need to supply a key for the OpenAI API. And uh, we are also conscious of uh, you know the, the security and privacy concerns around this, and uh, would be very careful that any tools that that we work on would be absolutely opt-in only. Um, any other questions coming in? Just uh, Wagtail AI is awesome. Thank you very much, Chinonso. Uh, and uh, a simplify this text would be great. So that's actually one of the examples that I've seen already. Um, Owen, some comments here that are interesting around uh, the ability to be able to highlight changes made by the AI. This is actually something that someone suggested the last time I showed it. I think it's a really good idea. Um, the, 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 the basic version I just showed then replaced my text with a fixed one, but I think it would be nice to, uh, to show what the changes were. And I, I think we should we try and think about the best UI for achieving that. That is it for the AI demo. And indeed, that brings our, uh, our webinar to an end. Uh, if you have any other questions, then ask them now or, or just send them on to Lisa, who will be following up with the links from today's webinar and anything that we missed today that we covered in the previous one. And with that, I think we're going to say goodbye and look forward to seeing you at the next episode of What's New in Wagtail. Thank you to all our speakers as well. I just really appreciate it. So we do this twice. So we, we did it yesterday for the UK EU time and then we do it again today. So I really appreciate it. Everyone's done such a brilliant job and kept the timings, which always makes me really happy. And thank you. We've had a really good turnout today as well. And thanks for all your brilliant questions. So like Tom says, we hope to see you again soon at another What's New Magtail. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.